twelve. There is no good decision here. After a half hour of utter darkness and silence, it seemed safe to light the torches, and all breathed sighs of relief, all except Oscar. The soothing effects of Gustav's drought were wearing off, and he began to look around uneasily and mutter about. The weight, the stone, there is no air. Why ever did you decide to become a soldier gunner? Grumbled Howes. Is there nothing you ain't afraid of? I never meant to be a soldier, murmured Oscar, slurring a little. I was my lord Gottenstadt's secretary. I wrote his correspondence for him, read it too, illiterate, the old fool. But one day... He sighed and stopped. The others waited for him to continue, but he seemed to have forgotten he was talking. One day what? asked Pavel, annoyed. Huh? said Oscar. Yes. Well, one day I was with my lord when he was surveying some land he owned. He wanted to build a, a hunting lodge, I think it was. And while the surveyor was using his plumb line and his measuring sticks to calculate distances and heights, I was guessing, and coming right almost to the foot. I picked out far away things that the surveyor needed his spyglass to make out. Sigmar's lightning, lad says Gottenstedt. You've got the making of a fine mortar man. And nothing would do, but he must send me to the artillery school in Nuln. Me, a scholar. I tried to tell him that though my eyes might be strong, my insides were weak, but he would have none of it. He shrugged. Of course I didn't help matters by coming out top of my class. I liked the work, making the sightings, calling out the degrees, but on the field... He shivered and hugged his shoulders. Did you ever see the fire from the sky? The thing with the mouths? He looked around him suddenly as if waking up, his eyes widening as he took the closed stone walls, the low ceiling. The weight, he murmured. Sigmar, save us. The weight. Can't breathe. Reiner grimaced, uncomfortable. Gustav, give him another sip, will ya? The corridor sank deeper and deeper into the mountains. Occasionally, corridors branched off to the left and right, iron rails gleaming away into the darkness. Some were barricaded off, and the party could see evidence of cave-ins behind them, but there was no confusion on which way to go. The deep tracks of the cannon's wheels always pointed the way. A while later, the iron rails began to sing, and soon after came a metallic rumbling. The company doused their torches and ducked into a side tunnel. After a moment, a train of carts rolled by, full of ore, each pushed by a team of shackled slaves, their eyes dull. A Corgan overseer reclined in the first cart, a lantern at his side. Franz cursed under his breath once they passed. So many of them, and one of him. Couldn't they strangle him, dump him down a shaft? And then, asked Reiner. The boy grunted with frustration, but could not provide an answer. As the train's rumble faded, it revealed nearer sounds. The thud and chink of picks biting into rock, the crack of whips, the barking of hounds. They stepped back into the main corridor and looked forward. A faint light picked out distant sections of wall, the glint of rails. Reiner looked at the cannon's wheel tracks, running straight ahead and sighed. It looks as if the warband marched beyond the work party. We will have to take side corridors around them, and hope we can find the tracks on the other side. Keep the torches dark. We'll travel by lantern only. They continued forward in the main tunnel, until the reflected light became bright enough for them to be able to see each other's faces, then began hunting for cross corridors. The sounds of mining came mostly from the left of the main tunnel, so they edged right, taking thinner tunnels and winding crawlways. After a time they found a promising corridor that paralleled the main corridor. It was nearly as wide, 
and had rails running down the center. These seemed both newer and cruder than the rails they had followed from the ironworks. The sounds of mining reached them only as echoes here, and came more from their left than from in front of them. Reiner began to feel almost hopeful. As long as they could find a way back to the main tunnel from here, there was a good chance they would pass the work party without incident. But just as he thought it, the rails began to ring and rattle. There were carts in coming. Reiner groaned. Speak of evil. There was a small side tunnel up ahead. Reiner pointed to it. In there, it has no rails. They hurried into it. It ended after thirty paces in a round, dug-out area with no other exit. A dead end. Right, said Reiner. We'll wait here until they pass. The echoing rumble of wheels grew suddenly louder, and the torch glow much brighter as if the approaching carts had turned a corner. The men faced back to the wide corridor, hands on their weapons. Giano shuttered his lantern and hid it behind him. As they watched, a procession of four heavily loaded carts passed by their hiding place. A Corgan guard followed the carts, torch in one hand and a huge hound on a leash snuffling along at his side. The Corgan walked on, kicking pebbles, but the hound stopped, sniffing at the mouth of the tunnel. The Corgan tugged on his leash, but the hound refused to move. Reiner's shoulders tensed. Go! He whispered under his breath. Go! Go! The Corgan stopped and cursed the hound, jerking at its leash. The hound snarled at him, then began barking down at the door. Sigmar, curse you, heathen! muttered Howes. Beat that cur! Make him heal! But the Corgan had decided that the hound was onto something and came forward warily, the hound still barking and straining at his leash. Reiner and the rest backed out of sight into the round chamber. Better kill him quick! whispered Reiner, drawing his sword. But no guns, or they'll be all over us. The others armed themselves. We should draw them in, said Howes. Get them from all sides. Good idea, said Reiner. Franz, you're the bait. What? said Franz, confused. Reiner shoved the boy hard between the shoulder blades. He stumbled out of cover and froze like a rabbit staring up the tunnel at the advancing Kurgan in wide-eyed terror. The Kurgan roared a challenge and ran forward, dropping the hound's leash and drawing a hand-axe. The hound bounded forward, baying savagely. Franz scurried for the back wall. "'You dirty bastard!' he shrieked at Reiner. Pavel stuck his spear out across the opening at ankle height as the Kurgan and the hound charged in. The beast leapt it easily, but the norder fell flat on his face, and Hals, Gianna, and Reiner stuck him with their spears and swords. Ulf swung his maul at the hound and knocked it sideways as it lunged at Franz. The monster landed, snarling, and spun to meet this new threat. Ulf raised his hammer as it leapt and jammed a haft between its gaping jaws, stopping its fangs from reaching his neck. But the beast was so massive, it knocked the big man flat, and began raking at him with its claws. The Kurgan surged up, screaming fury and bleeding from three grievous wounds. Reiner was afraid that they had another iron-skinned berserker on their hands, but fortunately, though as big as a bull, the guard was no chosen champion, only a rancor, stuck in the mines, guarding slaves, while others won glory on the fields of honor. Reiner chopped halfway through his windpipe, and he died on his knees, breathing his last through his neck. The hound was another matter. Franz and Oscar were slashing at it with their swords, but the blows couldn't penetrate the beast's matted coat. Ulf, on his back under the monster, was forcing its head back with the haft of his maul, but his straining arms were being shredded by its claws. Reiner ran forward with Hals and Pavel. Giano dropped his sword and unslung his crossbow, drawing a bolt from his quiver. 
Gustav kept out of the way as usual. Reiner slashed at the hound's back legs, severing its left hamstring. It howled and turned, but fell as it put weight on its dead leg. Pavel and Hals gored it in the side with their spears. Still it fought, twisting so savagely that Pavel's spear was wrenched out of his fever-weakened hands and cracked Hals in the forehead. The hound lunged for the dazed pikeman, but Ulf, freed of its weight, clubbed it with all his might, square on its spinal ridge. It dropped flat, its legs splayed. Giano stepped forward and fired his crossbow point-blank. The bolt pinned the monster's head to the ground, and it died in a spreading pool of blood. Nice work, lads, said Reiner. Wolf, are you hurt badly? Howls. Just a little swimmy, Captain, said Howls. It'll pass. I've had worse, said Wolf, grimacing as he examined his lacerated biceps. But not by much. Just coming, said Gustav. He began opening his kit. Reiner looked toward the corridor, looking for reinforcements, and froze, heart thudding, as he saw half a dozen faces looking back at him. The slaves were peering anxiously down the tunnel at them. Reiner had forgotten all about them. What do we do about that lot? asked Hals, joining him. Pavel looked up. Poor devils! We must free them, said Franz. Bring them with us. You crazy boy, said Giano. They slow us down. We no make it. But we can't just leave them here, said Pavel. The Kurgan will kill them for sure. Ulf grunted as Gustav cleaned his wounds. The Kurgan will kill them regardless. Whether now or later. It's your decision, Captain, said Howells. Reiner cursed under his breath. This is exactly why I don't want to lead. There is no good decision here. He chewed his lip, thinking, but whichever way he turned it, it was bad. Your best course is to put them out of their misery, said Gustav. They are no longer men. What does a monster know of men? spit Howells. Reiner wanted to punch Gustav, not for being wrong, but for being right. The surgeon always took the bleakest view of every situation, had the most cynical view of human nature, and so often turned out to be the one Reiner should have listened to. Killing them would be best. The slaves were too weak to keep up, and would stretch their food supply much too thin. But Reiner could feel Franz's eyes upon him, and Pavel's one-eyed gaze as well, and couldn't give the order. We'll free them, and, and offer them the choice to follow us or not. He flushed as he said it, for it was a horrible equivocation, a mere sop to common sense. What other choice did the slaves have? He was dooming the men who depended on him, because he didn't have the heart to kill men who were virtually dead already. Franz and Pavel nodded, satisfied, but Gustav made a disgusted sound and Giano groaned. The rest looked non-committal. Reiner fished the keys from the dead Kurgan's belt and started down the tunnel to the large corridor. Franz fell in beside him. That was a rotten trick just then, pushing me into danger. Reiner's teeth clenched. He was getting tired of feeling guilty. I had faith in you. But I've lost a little in you, the boy countered, then shrugged. Though you do a brave thing here, I do a foolish thing here. The slaves edged warily back as Reiner and his men came out of the tunnel. There were sixteen of them, four teams to push the four carts, which were filled with waste rock. Each starving quartet was shackled together at the ankles. Reiner held up the keys. Don't be afraid. We're going to free you. The slaves stared, uncomprehending, and flinched back again as he approached them. Hold still. The slaves did as they were told. Commands seemed to be the only speech they understood. 
Reiner squatted and unlocked the four locks in turn. Franz and Pavel followed behind him, pulling the chain that linked them through the slave's shackles until all of them were free. Reiner faced them. There you are. You are slaves no more. You're welcome to follow us to freedom, or to take whatever path you wish. The slaves blinked at him, eyes blank. Reiner coughed. What was wrong with them? Were they deaf? Do you understand? You're free. You can travel with us if you wish. One of the slaves, a woman with no hair, began to weep, a dry, scratchy sound. It's a trick, said another. They mean to trap us again. Stop torturing us, cried a third. It isn't a trick, said Franz, as the slaves whispered among themselves. You are truly free. Don't listen to them, said the slave who had first spoken. They only mean to catch us out. Go back to the workforce. Warn the masters. He backed away from Reiner and began running back down the corridor. The others ran with him, like sheep running because other sheep were running. Curse it, growled Reiner. Stop! He grabbed at the fleeing slave, but the skeletal man squirmed out of his fingers. Stop them! He called to the others. What are they doing? asked Franz, confounded, as the others tried to quarrel the slaves. Why are they running? They are lost, as I told you, said Gustav, sneering. Pavel, Hals, Oscar and Giano grabbed a handful of the slaves and pushed them to the floor, but more were disappearing into darkness. Never mind why, said Reiner, running down the hole. We have to shut them up before they bring their overseers down on us. Giano, bring the lantern. Reiner and Franz chased the slaves with Giano, Ulf and Hals running behind them. Giano's slotted lantern throwing dancing bars of light on the uneven walls. Reiner was surprised at how fast the slaves moved. He thought they would be weak from starvation, but it seemed that their constant labor had given them a wiry power. And Reiner and the others had difficulty keeping up, let alone catching up, for the slaves seemed to know every inch of the tunnels in the dark. Come back, curse you, he called after them but this order they did not follow. The slaves reached the main corridor and turned right. As he angled in behind them, Reiner could see the glow of torches up ahead. He put on a burst of speed and caught the last slave around the neck, bringing him down. The others leapt ahead, wailing and scattered. Some continued down the main corridor, some swerved into side corridors. All started shouting as loud as their rusty voices would allow. Masters! Masters! Help! Franz darted into the first side corridor after two slaves, but Reiner collared him and pulled him back. Don't be a fool. We must stick together. Too late anyway, sighed Giano, as hounds began to bay, and harsh Kurgan orders echoed through the tunnels. The thud of heavy boots began to converge on them. Reiner groaned. Back to the others! Quick! He turned and started running back down the corridor, Franz, Giano, Oscar and Hals following in his wake. Franz seemed almost on the point of tears. Why did they do it? We only wanted to help. Been underground so long, said Hals. They will live in the sun no more. I don't understand, Franz wailed. I'll explain it to you if we live said Reiner. Now run! They sprinted back toward where they had left the others. The Kurgan were too big to move quickly and did not gain on them, but the hounds were faster than horses. Reiner could hear the baying coming closer and closer. At last, he rounded a bend in the corridor and saw Pavel, Oscar and Gustav by the minecarts standing guard over the slaves they had caught. Run! called Reiner. Get up, you lot, growled Pavel to the slaves, prodding them with his spear. Get moving! But when he and Oscar 
let them up, the slaves ran toward Reiner and his companions. Reiner tried to stop on as she ran by, as did Franz, but the slaves dodged away from them and ran on, toward the hounds. The fools! The fools! sobbed Franz. The company squeezed past the minecarts. Screams of agony and animal snarls echoed from behind. Reiner felt a stab of self-loathing as he found himself hoping that the hounds would stop to eat the slaves that he had gone to such pains to free only moments earlier. This did not appear to be the case, for the baying and shouting continued to grow louder. They rounded another bend, and Giano fell sprawling over some loose rock. The lantern bounced out of his hand and smashed on the rail. The flame went out. Total darkness closed over them, and they jumbled to a stop. Myrmidia, curse me! cried Giano. No one move, said Reiner, as the baying and running boots echoed ever closer. All hold hands. If you are not holding a hand, speak up. He stretched out and took a rough hand. He had no idea who it was. I stand alone, said Gustav. You certainly do, mate. You certainly do, said Howells. Reiner reached toward Gustav's voice. Take my hand. Gustav's soft, fleshy hand batted at his, then caught it. Hurry, wailed Oscar. They're coming. Reiner looked back. Far down the corridor, huge hound shadows bounded and swooped along the walls. Then the hounds themselves came into view, massive black silhouettes running ahead of the chaos troops' torches. Reiner turned and ran, forgetting to give an order. But there was no need. The rest ran with him, blind as bats, whimpering in their throats. They all knew it was useless to run, but it was impossible not to. Fear drove their legs, not fought, the primal instinct for flight in the face of certain death. Reiner tripped over the rails, caught himself, and crowded against the wall to avoid the ties. He could hear Gustav's wheezing and stumbling behind him, and not twenty paces behind him, the panting and snarling of the hounds. So this was it, Reiner thought. He was going to die, lost to all he loved and all who loved him, in a black tunnel under the middle mountains, eaten by monstrous hounds. The things he had yet to do crowded into his head, all the money he hadn't yet won or spent, all the women he had yet to bed, books unread, the loves unloved. He found himself weeping with regret. It had all been so damned useless, the whole horrible journey, his whole life. Franz shrieked from the back of the line. Ulf roared something incoherent, and Reiner heard an impact and an animal yelp. He looked back, but there was little to see except leaping shadows and bobbing torches in the distance. Franz? The boy's answer was lost, as, at the head of the line, Giano screamed. His scream was repeated by Pavel and Halls, and there was a sound of rattling pebbles and strange echoes. Reiner tried to halt before he ran into the hidden danger, but Gustav, Ulf and Franz piled into him from behind, sending him flying forward again. Wait! he cried. Something! His left foot came down on empty air. He yelled in surprise and threw his hands out, expecting to hit the tunnel floor face first. His hands touched nothing. There was nothing below him. He was falling into a bottomless void.